please review the pertinent CME guidelines here regarding the release dates, review dates, expiration dates, and credits available for this course. I'm Dr. Jessica Snow with Pediatric Infectious Disease at the Children's Hospital in Omaha, and today we're going to be talking about recommendations for pneumococcal vaccination in children. My CME disclosures are listed here, none of which should conflict with the things we're going to talk about today. Bacterial infections caused by streptococcus pneumoniae are among the most common and serious that we currently deal with in children. It's a very common cause of bacteremia, meningitis, pneumonia, and upper respiratory infection in children. According to the CDC, pneumococcus kills more people in the United States than all other vaccine-preventable infections combined. It's spread by respiratory secretions and is a common part of the upper respiratory bacterial flora of children. There are many different serotypes of pneumococcus that cause human disease. Thus, a history of invasive pneumococcal disease does not preclude vaccination. And in fact, most of our children have had pneumococcal disease. They've had ear infections, which is probably the most common thing that we're going to see with pneumococcal disease. But even many other children, you will see a history of bacteremia and other things. This should not contraindicate future vaccination. Conjugated pneumococcal vaccines for children were recently expanded to cover the 13 most common serotypes of pneumococcus in the United States. This expansion from Prevnar 7 to Prevnar 13 also targeted the serotypes that were most likely to be resistant to antibiotics. So we're not only covering the ones that are going to be the most commonly seen, but also those that are most difficult to treat and invasive in our children. The patients at highest risk for serious and invasive pneumococcal disease particularly include those with impaired splenic function, either surgically or anatomically asplenic, or those with sickle cell disease where they may be functionally asplenic. Patients with primary immune deficiency, particularly hypogammaglobulinemia and complement deficiencies are at high risk for invasive disease. Other immunocompromising conditions, including HIV, nephrotic syndrome, and chronic renal disease, as well as cochlear implants, CSF leaks, and all children less than age 5, and all adults over age 65. This is a disease that impacts a large proportion of the population. Pneumococcal vaccines for children include PCV7, or the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine 7 serotype, which was produced by Pfizer in 2000, commonly referred to as Prevnar. It covered serotypes 4, 6V, 9V, 14, 18C, 19F, and 23F. This has been phased out since the introduction of Prevnar 13, which is what we currently use. PCV13, or Prevnar 13, is produced by Pfizer, was released in 2010, and in addition to the serotypes covered by PCV7, the original Prevnar, it adds serotype 1, 3, 5, 6A, 7F, and 19A, 19A of particular importance in terms of its resistance and invasiveness. This current vaccine conglomerate covers 68% of the invasive pneumococcal isolates in the United States. It's important to note that the serotypes of invasive pneumococcal isolates vary with region and country. So when you're reading studies about the effectiveness of this vaccine, um, be aware of the location as to where it occurred, because in different parts of the world, different serotypes are prevalent and therefore different vaccine targets may be more appropriate. Also available is Synflorx, which is PCV10. It is produced by GlaxoSmithKline and was released in 2008. It covers Prevnar 7 components plus serotypes 1, 5, and 7F. It covers 12% of the current invasive pneumococcal isolates in the United States and therefore is not used as much here. However, it is used in other countries worldwide because of the different serotype prevalence in other parts of the world. The Pneumovax, or adult pneumonia shot, is what most people call this, the pneumonia shot, was released in the 1970s by Merck um, and Wyeth. It is a polysaccharide-based vaccine, so it tends not to work as well in young children. Um, that includes 23 different serotypes of pneumococcus. It's ineffective in children younger than 24 months of age, but if you have a patient two years or older, there may be certain indications for this vaccine. PCV13, or Prevnar13, is currently recommended for all children under 5 years of age in the United States. The recommended dosing schedule is at 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months of age. There is a catch-up schedule depending on what prior products and the age of your child is. Um, so children with no or incomplete pneumococcal vaccination should receive catch-up vaccine if they are under 59 months of age. Again, remembering that children under age 5 are at the highest risk group for invasive pneumococcal disease. The minimal interval between doses of Prevnar 7 or Prevnar 13 in children less than 12 months of age is four weeks for early doses and eight weeks for the next to last dose. 
transitioning between PCV7 and PCV13, which should not be occurring at this point. I think most of our patients have aged out of this, but just in case you run across someone who got some PCV7, um, if they started their vaccination series with PCV7, those doses will count, but they should complete the series with PCV13. Even if a child completed the four-dose series with PCV7, they should receive a booster dose of PCV13 at least eight weeks after the most recent dose of PCV7 if they are less than 59 months of age. Remembering that the Prevnar 13 or the PCV13 significantly expands the coverage that we get by pneumococcal vaccination, so you want to protect patients in that high-risk group of less than five years of age as well as you can. Side effects of PCV13 vary by dose and age, but in general, about half of children become drowsy after the shot, had a temporary loss of appetite, or had redness or tenderness where the shot was given. About one in three had swelling where the shot was given, and about one in three had a mild fever. Approximately one in 20 had a higher fever, over 102.2, and up to about eight out of 10 became fussy or irritable. Adults receiving the vaccine have reported redness, pain, and swelling where the shot was given. Mild fever, fatigue, headaches, chills, and muscle pain have also been reported. PCV13 in high-risk patients is important um, and may require vaccination outside or in addition to the normal schedule. So in patients who are at high risk for serious or invasive pneumococcal disease, they should receive PCV13 per the normal vaccination schedule. If they completed their original pneumococcal vaccine series with PCV7, they should receive a supplemental dose of PCV13 regardless of their age. So if you are less than 71 months of age and received fewer than three doses of PCV7, then they should receive two doses to complete their series. This would apply if you had a child who had hypogammaglobulinemia or asplenia. Um, you would want to make sure you give them a booster dose of PCV7, even if they had previously competed their dose of PCV, um, a booster dose of PCV13, even if they had previously competed their prior course with original Prevnar 7. They should also receive the PCV13 in addition to any PPS23, so any Pneumovax they may have gotten. If you have a child, a high-risk child who got Pneumovax at two or three years of age, you want to go back and also give them a dose of Prevnar 13, again, because this is a more effective vaccine in children and it provides added coverage for pneumococcal serotypes. Certain adults age 19 years of age and older should also receive a supplemental dose of PCV13 if they weren't previously vaccinated. So if you are a young adult or adult of any age who has asplenia, a CSF leak, cochlear implants, or an immunocompromising condition like a complement defect or hypogammaglobulinemia, that patient should also receive PCV13 regardless of their prior Prevnar vaccination history, regardless of their prior Pneumovax history. Again, you want to separate the dose of PCV13 from any prior Prevnar vaccine by eight weeks. Interestingly, recently they have recommended PCV13 or Prevnar 13 for adults over age 65 who were not previously vaccinated for pneumococcus. So all adults 65 years of age or older will receive a dose of PCV13 followed by a dose of Pneumovax or the polysaccharide vaccine 6 to 12 months later. Pneumovax is sometimes used in children, remembering that we are not going to administer this vaccine until they're at least two years of age. It can be used in children with chronic cardiovascular disease, chronic pulmonary disease, excluding asthma, smokers over age 19, patients with diabetes, patients with chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease or nephrotic syndrome, patients with cochlear implants, ideally before the procedure is done, patients with CSF leaks, patients with functional, anatomic, or surgical asplenia, and patients with immunocompromising decision conditions like we've discussed before, including hypogammaglobulinemia, complement defects, or HIV. This would also include hematopoietic and solid organ transplant recipients, as well as patients on immunosuppressive therapy for rheumatologic conditions or malignancy. In patients who are transplant recipients, we start inactivated vaccines, such as the pneumococcal vaccine, three to six months post-transplant, depending on the scenario. High-risk patients can receive the Pneumovax vaccine starting at 24 months of age. You want to administer the dose at least eight weeks after the most recent Prevnar 7 or 13. If they have not yet received Prevnar 13, they should first receive a dose of Prevnar 13 followed by Pneumovax eight weeks later. Children with an immunocompromising condition, chronic renal disease, transplant, or asplenia should receive a second dose of Pneumovax five years after the first dose. 
The pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, or Pneumovax, has similar side effects to the other vaccines that we've discussed. About half of people who get Pneumovax have mild side effects such as redness or pain where the shot is given. Less than 1% develop a fever, muscle aches, or more severe local reactions. A vaccine like any medicine could cause a serious reaction, but the risk of a vaccine causing serious harm or death is extremely small. Pneumococcal vaccines can get complicated in your high-risk patient population, so let's go through some special situations. If you have a sickle cell patient or patient who is otherwise immunocompromised, such as someone with a complement defect or hypogammaglobulinemia, ideally they would receive Prevnar 13 at 2, 4, 6, and 12 to 15 months. They would then receive Pneumovax or the polysaccharide vaccine at 2 years and again at 7 years. They will then receive Pneumovax again at 65 years of age. If you have a sickle cell patient or other immunocompromised patient who was previously vaccinated with Prevnar 7 and they are less than 71 months of age, so less than six years old, you want to give them Prevnar 13 at least eight weeks after their last dose of pneumococcal vaccine. You will then give them Pneumovax or the polysaccharide vaccine eight weeks after that dose of Prevnar 13. They will get another dose of Pneumovax five years later and then a dose of Pneumovax at 65 years of age. Post-transplant patients will start vaccinations with inactivated vaccines at three to six months following the transplant, assuming all is going well with a three-dose series of Prevnar 13, followed by a dose of Pneumovax. As an inactive vaccine, Prevnar 13 and Pneumovax can generally be given at the same time as other vaccines. There are exceptions. You cannot give Pneumovax and Prevnar 13 at the same visit. Pneumovax, the polysaccharide vaccine, interferes with Prevnar, the conjugate vaccine. If administered together, the Pneumovax would count, but the Prevnar needs to be repeated. Co-administration with meningococcal conjugate vaccine depends on the product used. If you are using the Menactra product by Sanofi, you need to give the Prevnar vaccine, Prevnar 13 vaccine first, with a four-week separation between the final dose of Prevnar and meningococcus, as the meningococcal vaccine can decrease the efficacy of the pneumococcal vaccine. And in high-risk patients who receive both vaccines, which are typically are immunocompromised or asplenic patients, the pneumococcal coverage should take priority. If you are using the Minveo product or the Minhibrix product, you can give both products simultaneously or at any other interval you'd like. During the 2010 to 2011 influenza season, it was noted that children aged 12 to 23 months had increased risk of febrile seizure if they received their Prevnar 13 and inactivated trivalent flu vaccine on the same day. My son was actually receiving both these vaccines during this time frame, and what we did was to separate those two vaccines on two separate visits. Globally, there has been a significant decrease in vaccine-type invasive pneumococcal disease since the introduction of Prevnar. The median reduction rate has been 90%, and this varies depending on the vaccine used and the population studied. As we discussed earlier, serotypes can vary geographically. The decrease in overall invasive pneumococcal disease depends on the local flora present at the time. Serotype replacement since introduction of Prevnar 7 has occurred globally. In the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, and Belgium, serotype 19A has been the most common replacing serotype. When we talk about a replacing serotype, what we are referring to is a vaccine serotype that increases in frequency after your vaccine eliminates the more common ones. So after Prevnar 7, when we eliminated the seven components that were involved in the vaccine, we did see an increase in certain other types, and 19A was one of those. 19A is particularly problematic as it was associated with invasive disease and very high rates of antibiotic resistance. Therefore, it was included in Prevnar 13. It is important to note that it's not included in PCV10. However, serotype 19A was geographically described in the areas where Prevnar 13 has been targeted. The most significant impact of Prevnar and Prevnar 13 have been seen in children under age 2, although benefits have been observed in older children and adults as well. Sinusitis dropped from 70 cases per 100,000 person years to 24 cases per 100,000 person years in children ages 0 to 2. Pneumonia also significantly dropped in children under age 2. And 25% of reduction in hospitalizations overall has been attributable to Prevnar's introduction. There have been decreases in adult invasive pneumococcal disease as well, which is likely due to the fact that children are the primary nasopharyngeal reservoirs of pneumococcus. For more information, you can go to the CDC's website. They have information on both the general vaccines as well as ACIP recommendations, where these are updated frequently. In addition, for information for families or for posting in your office, you can always look at the Immunization Action Coalition, which is immunize.org, for updates for these and more information.
Spend Oh, it's we got cards in this. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna be here a minute. Yeah. I'm gonna be here a minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I need that. Getting angry notes from a printer. <laughs> 